The police in Nashville may have a very big problem on their hands. I'm Aiden Mattis, and welcome back to The Lore Lodge. This channel typically does not cover ongoing missing persons cases, at least in the sense that if somebody has been missing a few weeks, we don't look into it because that person still may be found and typically there's very little information to go on. So we focus our efforts, our energy on things that happened at least a few months ago, but often many years ago where people have had time to go and look at the evidence and compile things and maybe there were just connections that weren't made along the way. So when Riley Strain went missing on March 8th, 2024 and people brought it to our attention and said, hey, this could be related to the whole smiley face theory that you guys have been covering, we decided we were gonna sit back and wait that this, this was not something that we could talk about right now. He hadn't even been found yet we wanted to allow things to develop first. And when it was first brought to our attention, all anybody knew was that Riley Strain was a six foot six inch tall, 165 pound, 22 year old, who had, you know, blonde hair and either blue or brown eyes, because his a family friend said blue and a, a missing poster said brown. That was a little confusing. We also knew he was wearing blue jeans, cowboy boots, and a white and black shirt, that it was white on one half and black on the other. That is literally all anybody knew about Riley on March 9th, 2024. And even as the evidence that something bad had happened to Riley started to mount up, we hoped that this would all end in a, you know, a happy ending, that Riley would turn up somewhere, that maybe something bad had happened, but he had survived it. And that was until his body was pulled from the Cumberland River on March 22nd. But even then, we didn't have autopsy results. There was nothing we could go on, nothing that could, you know, be used to reasonably question what happened here. So I figured that we were going to be sitting for a while, that Riley Strain was going to be up in the air, and eventually they would release the autopsy results, we'd have crime scene photos maybe, and we could finally look at it and say, is this our kind of thing? But something was released a little bit early that, that made me decide to move the timeline up here. And when I say it made me move the timeline up, I mean we were gonna be doing a completely different video on a completely different Smiley Face Killers case this week. So Wednesday, uh, maybe even, yeah, I think it was, yeah, was it Wednesday or Thursday that it changed my mind? Uh, I think it was Wednesday. Yeah. Literally Wednesday evening, I decided to change my mind when the news dropped that Riley Strain's preliminary autopsy results had come back with a cause of death of an accidental alcohol-related drowning with no water in the lungs. It's that last bit, the lack of water in a drowning victim's lungs, that got me to look at this a little bit more quickly. And as I was looking through everything that's been reported that we do know so far, the other thing that hit me is, it's really hard to follow this case from the reporting that currently exists. There's been developments, there's been red herrings, there's timelines that don't go into enough detail on what specifically happened or was said, and I thought one thing that could be useful before the conspiracy theory community gets their hands on this, is to have a full accounting of everything we actually know from that night, the story as it actually happened, rather than just kind of the conjecture and the, the miscellaneous reports here and there. So what I can say with certainty is after putting all of that together, after reading, you know, 50 to 60 different articles on the disappearance of Riley Strain, there were some things that started to pop out at me that really led me to question everything that's going on here, and the whole accidental drowning idea. And the main reason I felt it was really important to cover this now, rather than waiting for full autopsy results and talk screen and all of that, is that I am very concerned that the police will look at this as simply another accidental drowning, that they will file away as that. And if they do that, and I'm right about what I'm about to go through for you, I worry that there will be another body, and then possibly another one, and another one after that. This is because we've been looking at these sets of cases, these clusters of young men who drown pretty frequently in college towns, but just in big cities in general. These are usually young men like the 22-year-old Riley. They're usually well-educated and successful. He was a business and finance major. They're usually pretty popular. He was in the Delta Chi fraternity at the University of Missouri. These are usually guys who are conventionally attractive, or at the very least, they're typically tall and in good shape. He was both. 
These young men, who are typically found with a blood alcohol level and in the river and deemed accidental drownings by the police, and he disappeared after a night out at the bars drinking with his friends. Basically just filling out the entire profile of what is typically referred to as the smiley face killer theory. Now personally, I don't know where I net out on that theory. I'm still skeptical that these are all connected cases, but when we looked into Luke Homan's death in La Crosse, Wisconsin, we saw other cases that were a little too similar to his. The same thing happened in Pittsburgh with Dakota James. And if we look at Riley's experience the night he went missing, it sounds entirely too much like that of Luke Homan, like that of Dakota James, like that of all of these other young men that we have covered. And of course, the, the key factor connecting all of these things, at least in theory, is that these men go missing after leaving a bar. Unfortunately, since this is a very, very new case, there's not a ton of information about what went on before that exit from the bar did, but I can go through what we do know. As far as that evening goes, the information that we have is as follows. Riley was staying with several fraternity brother friends at the Tempo Hotel at 127 Rosa L. Parks Boulevard. They were in town for some sort of fraternity conference or formal trip. Uh, it was hard to understand exactly what it was. A very few names have been released. So again, not a ton of detail, but what we do know is he was there for a Delta Chi trip, staying at a hotel with some of his fraternity brothers. And the hotel is not at all far from Nashville's famous Broadway Strip. I've been to Nashville twice. I spent a lot of time on that strip while I was down there. The hotel he was staying at isn't exactly, you know, parallel to the, the bar scene down there, but it's also not far from it at all, a couple of blocks. It's unclear precisely how long they had been out and about on the evening of March 8th, but between 7.30 and 8 o'clock p.m., Riley called his mom on FaceTime from the Friends in Low Places bar, and he just was telling her about the night they were having, his stepdad was in the room, and he, he heard all of this go down, he understood what was going on. And as far as Riley had told anybody, they had started the evening by going to the Casa Rosa bar owned by Miranda Lambert, and then they had progressed on to Friends in Low Places. He had been drinking the whole time, but according to his mother and his stepfather, he did not seem like he was drunk. He seemed like he was having fun, but not sloppy, not falling over, not slurring words. Sometime after hanging up with his mother, Riley and his friends switched bars and they went over to Luke Bryan's 32 Bridge. Bar records show that while there, Riley purchased one alcoholic beverage and two waters, and then at 9.35 p.m., he was escorted out of the bar's front entrance for behavioral reasons. They said that he had violated their behavioral code of conduct. What exactly they meant by this has not been released. They have not given a just straight reason for Riley's removal, at least not to the public. The police may have one. In any case, security escorted Riley and one of his friends down to the front entrance of the bar, at which point Riley left while his friend returned and went back inside. Now, the reporting on this entire episode is a little bit unclear. I found some references to a statement given by Riley's friends, but I was unable to track down the statement itself. The way things appear to be, Riley's friends told somebody, either the family of Riley Strain or the police, someone, that they were not allowed to leave the bar with Riley. That, I guess, you know, they, they had a tab, so they weren't allowed to leave with him until they paid their tab. The bar, however, said that there was no tab keeping them there and that it was not the bar's policy to prevent people from leaving if they failed to pay their tab. Having worked in bars in a couple of different towns in my life, I can confirm that we never had a policy that somebody was not allowed to leave without paying their tab. We never stopped people at the door to ask if they had paid their tab. So if this is actually something Riley's friends said, I've also been drinking in Nashville in multiple bars, not this specific one, but I've gone to probably over a dozen different bars on Broadway and not a single one stopped me at the door to ask if I had paid my tab. So if this is actually something that his friends did tell investigators, did tell the family, then it's most likely in my opinion that they were lying about it, especially since the bar said that they had no such policy. There are a few different reasons that I could think of that they may have lied, but I don't believe they had anything to do with Riley's disappearance. I think that they likely were just afraid of being considered guilty by either the police or by Riley's family, and so they looked for some reason that they couldn't leave the bar. Because let's be realistic, 
These are young guys. One of their friends just, you know, went missing and was pulled out of a river. I know that the first instinct, my first instinct, was to say, this is your fault. This, you know, you should have been with him to criticize, to guilt them about it. But what I want to say is, you know, they made a mistake that plenty of other people make. And it went horribly in this one case. But I am sure these guys are going to feel guilt for the rest of their lives. I know that the family has expressed that they're not angry with Riley's friends. So what I wanted to say here is before you, you know, think to, to go to the angle of being angry at these people, these young men who are Riley's friends who let him go, yes, it's, it's right to have some form of uh, irritation, to, to feel like, you know, maybe if they had left with him, this wouldn't have happened. That's fair. But what's also fair is to say these are a bunch of 22-year-old guys. They are probably distraught right now over the loss of their friend. Nothing good is going to come from you know, harassing them or abusing them or making them feel bad about this. What's important right now is to try and figure out if what happened to Riley was actually an accident. So I just wanted to make it clear that throughout this video, if it sounds like I am criticizing his friends at all, that criticism is more about the general population and all of us being better when it comes to keeping track of our friends when we're out drinking. We all need to be good about this. This needs to be something that you have a discussion about when you go out, especially in an unfamiliar place. Remember, these guys were in from out of town. When you are traveling, especially if you're going to be drinking, make sure that you have a plan with your friends, that you always use the buddy system, nobody goes anywhere alone, and that you have designated rendezvous points for if anybody's phone dies, something like that, preferably something that's easily recognizable, a landmark, and that's something that's in a well-lit area. I will say, in Nashville, this is extraordinarily easy to do on Broadway. Every single bar has huge glowing signs saying what it is. So any criticism that seems like it is being directed at his friends is not meant to be uh, making them feel bad. It's meant to be a, a lesson. Hey, we, need, we all need to be better. This could have been any of us. And it doesn't only have to be in big cities like Nashville. I've lost Aiden in Phoenixville multiple times and we both live here. Yeah, a little too many times where I just decided to disappear for a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you've got a friend like Aiden Thornbury, just put like a tile in their pocket or like an apple tracker thing. It'll work wonders. I'm like a boomerang, though. I always come back. It's true. He's also very small and throwable. Yes. Bringing things back to Riley, however, if you look at the situation, they were remarkably proactive in trying to figure out where he was after he left the bar. They say that they called him around 10 p.m. to ask where he was, but for reasons we'll get into in a moment, they must have called him even sooner than that. So they waited less than 20 minutes to call Riley and make sure he was still okay. And Riley told them, I'm just walking back to the hotel, I'm fine, don't worry about me. So the guys appear to have thought nothing of it, and based on what has been released so far, it seems like they stayed out to drink for another couple hours or so. Essentially, after Riley had left, the guys did everything right. They called, they checked in, they said, hey, you know, what's going on? And maybe the delay in them deciding to call him was a discussion of, hey, should we just leave? Should we go get him? Should we stay here? Should we, what should we do? And they probably decided, let's call him if he needs us to leave. If he wants us to leave, we'll go. And if he's cool, he's just headed back to the hotel, we'll stay here and chill. Which, again, that's the right thing to do in a situation like this. Uh, I probably would have left and gone to look for him, but even then, you still have to call and try to locate the guy first. And since he answered the phone and he said he was heading back to the hotel, there was no reason to location check him. Unfortunately, Riley actually wasn't headed back to the hotel, which is something his friends didn't figure out until they returned sometime before 1.30 a.m. When they arrived back at their room, Riley was not there, so they called him, and the phone went straight to voicemail. So they called again. Still no Riley. Texted. No response. At that point, they say they decided they were going to try and physically go to the police station to report him missing, but it was closed. And that's possible. I wasn't able to really check on that, but... It's possible it actually was closed. It was 1.35 in the morning. They then call the police. They call 911 to file a missing persons report. And his friend Braden even says on the phone, we tried to go to the station, but it was closed, so we, we called you. And from that point on, things get remarkably weird. And speaking of things that are remarkably weird, you may know that I'm currently involved in a vicious legal battle with Bigfoot. What you may not know is that my insurance has been less than helpful because they don't consider cryptid-involved incidents covered under my policy. So now we have to submit a separate lawsuit with my insurance company, in addition to the one with Bigfoot, because apparently everyone out there is trying to hurt me either physically, financially, or emotionally. 
That's why when we were looking for somebody to represent us, we needed a law firm that not only had our backs financially, but also could handle any curveballs that might be thrown at us. And that's why it was a no-brainer when we found Morgan & Morgan. Morgan & Morgan has modernized the injury law process so that you can submit a claim or communicate with your legal team all from your smartphone, even if it's right in the moment of the incident. That's important because time is of the essence when you're hurt and your injury could be worth millions. Just in the last couple of months, Morgan & Morgan saw verdicts over $26 million in the city of Philadelphia. For context, that is 40 times higher than the highest insurance offer. And with so much money at stake, the fact that Morgan & Morgan doesn't charge a fee unless they win is a really big help. And you can start a claim with America's largest injury law firm in just one click. It is so easy. If you found yourself injured, Bigfoot related or not, you can contact Morgan & Morgan by going to www.forthepeople.com slash lorelodge or by using the link in our description. But now that you've heard about our search for representation, we're going to talk about the search for Riley Strain. When Riley's friend Braden reported him missing to the police, he told them, We're here on a fraternity formal party. It's one of my good buddies. And he gave a description of 6'5", white, 22 years old, and blonde. He also told police the last time his phone was active, it was by the sheriff's office at like 11 p.m. And it appears they tried to locate him using Snapchat, which is not the most accurate unless you're on Wi-Fi. So he would have been anywhere in the vicinity of the police office. I'm gonna get into it in a second, but there's another reason why I think that the timing is off on here, and likely they checked around 11 and saw one hour ago. Later on Saturday, once, you know, the world was actually awake, Riley's parents were contacted and informed that he was missing, and they drove to Nashville that day. As far as any official effort goes, it seems that the police were still very much in the evidence collection phase. All anybody knew at this point was that Riley had been kicked out of the bar at 9.35 p.m., and his friends said that he appeared on Snapchat near the sheriff's office around 11 p.m. I wasn't able to find any information about if anything happened on the 10th of March, but on the 11th, the Metropolitan Nashville Police Department posted to X, formerly Twitter, basically giving a simple update. They were checking hospitals, prisons, shelters, all of that, asking the public for tips, and just kind of saying, hey, this guy is out and about, he's missing. Hospitals, prisons, all of that turned up no leads, but one thing that was circulating by the 11th is a screenshot, and it appears to be a screenshot from the Life360 app. This was likely provided by Riley's family, and what it says is that his phone either powered off or had no network at 9.53 p.m., and then it did not turn back on. This is why I say it's unlikely that Snapchat showed him as being near the sheriff's office at 11, but rather they probably checked and it said an hour ago, and they triangulated that to be 11. Another thing we can learn from the Life360 screenshot is that the phone did not die, it did not have low battery, because Life360 will tell you, you know, it will say you're at 10% battery, low battery, and it will send that out to everybody else in your family's network. I see this on my girlfriend's phone all the time, her family uses Life360, and I will see the notification pop up that her siblings have phones under 10% battery. So if his phone had gone below 10%, then his family would have known. They say that it didn't. They also say that the police reviewed the information and the police also say that his phone did not die. It did not lose battery. That means that the only way that that phone shows as being off is if somebody manually turned it off or possibly if somebody destroyed it. And the last location of this phone where it says that the phone was powered off or lost its network connection is under the James Robertson Parkway Bridge. And it's also just south of the county jail. And when I say just south, I mean, like, literally, the county jail is right over on the other side of the bridge. And not the other side of the bridge across the river, the other side of the bridge, walking under the bridge. And that area has multiple signs that say it is under 24-hour surveillance. These are important things to remember. Moving on from that, though, it seems that the first organized search occurred on the 12th, and that it was primarily focused along the, uh, the Cumberland River. Riley's family assisted with this search, but unfortunately, it yielded no results. On the same day, Luke Bryan's 32 Bridge posted a statement saying that they would be offering full compliance, their full support with the police department to make sure that anything that happened at their bar that night, the police knew about it. They also said that they had proactively been in touch with the Tennessee Liquor Control Board to make sure that they, you know, everybody knew that things were going 
as they should that night. The next day, the 13th, the police released footage of Riley for the first time, but for the sake of just clarity, I'm gonna go through everything they've released over the course of the investigation right now. The first clip is from 9.46 p.m., so about 11 minutes after Riley had left the bar, and this was from a security camera at Downtown Smoke and Vape Shop, which sits at 3rd and Church. One angle shows Riley jogging through the parking lot and then along the sidewalk on Church Street a few seconds later, and Riley is squatting on the ground, seemingly picking something up or putting something into his pocket. He then stands back up and starts to walk east. Just to be clear, he had been going east in the first place. He continues east, I should say. And once he gets up, it looks like he's stumbling a little bit. And then in the next frame, which is from further down church, he's really sort of struggling to walk straight. He seems like he's struggling to keep his head off. He keeps touching his head. He just looks significantly less coordinated. I mean, the guy goes from jogging to barely being able to stand up in a matter of seconds. In any case, that video catches him as he stumbles across 2nd Avenue North and then goes off camera as he continues heading northeast. The next clip is from just a minute later, 9.47 p.m., and it comes from a traffic cam located at First and Church. It shows Riley crossing First Avenue, standing there for a moment just kind of looking confused, and then proceeding further up church behind a small group of pedestrians. And I say further up church, but really this turns into gay. So we see him basically walking northeast along church, crossing First Avenue, standing there for a moment looking a little confused. It looks like maybe he talked to some people there, but nobody seems to respond to him. And then after sort of like wobbling for a second, he just continues up what is now Gay Street, adjacent to the Cumberland River. Then, just a few minutes later, at 9.52 p.m., Riley actually passes a police officer, and he even briefly converses with him. How you doing, sir? I'm good, how are you? Good. And it's weird because in the previous video, which is again only about five, six minutes earlier, Riley can barely stand up. He looks like he's genuinely struggling to remain on two feet and he looks very disoriented. And then when he passes the officer, the officer says, you know, good evening and it's, you know, hi, how you doing? I'm doing good, how are you, sir? Like just that. And Riley just continues walking along. He's perfectly upright, he sounds coherent, does not at all look like he has been falling all over the place. And I was able, using Google Street View, to figure out exactly where this encounter occurred, and it's about 175 feet south of the Woodland Street Bridge. Now, looking at it, it's important to recognize that this was just a few seconds long. He's only visible for a brief moment. They had a quick exchange of pleasantries, and that's really all we get here. We also know that the police officer was not there looking for Riley. He was responding to a call about a car being burglarized. As for Riley's part, I think any drunk 22-year-old guy can probably pull himself together quick enough to have a brief conversation with a cop. We can all flip a switch and be sober for the five seconds it takes to not get pinched for public drunkenness. Unfortunately, after this point, there is no publicly available footage of Riley Strain from that evening. We'll, we'll get into why I emphasize publicly available in just a moment. But for now, I wanna, there's, there's other stuff I need to present to you before this will make sense as to why it struck me as so odd. Also, just to circle back a little bit, the first of these clips was released on the 13th of March. The other update from the 13th of March was that they used sonar to scan the riverbanks for looking for Riley, but they didn't find anything. On the 14th, the police issued another update. They said that they were speaking to the people living in homeless encampments along the river, that they were gathering phone records, and that as of that point, they did not suspect foul play. They thought that whatever happened to Riley probably was just an accident. They also gave the update that there was no record of him using a taxi or rideshare service. Moving forward to the 15th, Luke Bryan's 32 Bridge posted another update, and they said this is where they revealed that Riley had only had the one drink at the bar, that he had ordered two waters, and he had been kicked out in accordance with their behavioral conduct standards. As to what those violations of their behavioral conduct standards were, it's not clear, 
Basically, every source says that he was just overly intoxicated, which means that it could just be that they kicked him out because he was too drunk to serve, at which point they can make no money off of him, and all he can really be is a liability. The only information we get further is that his stepfather told the media that uh, Riley was trying to do a good deed, and the bar felt like maybe he had enough. He also made it very clear that there was no sort of argument or altercation, no male or female involved. It seems like whatever happened, Riley went and spoke to a bartender or a bouncer. That bartender or bouncer decided that he was too drunk to be there and said, hey, you need to leave. My guess is he probably saw a, a guy and a girl having a discussion and thought maybe the, the guy was a problem and went and tried to tell somebody and they decided, ah, this guy is just drunk and needs to go. But I don't want to speculate. I don't know what happened. Only Riley's friends do, and it seems that uh, they have been instructed not to talk to the media by the police. And before anybody jumps to anything, I am aware that that could sound sketchy, but it could also be that the police wanted to make sure that there was nothing floating around that might muddy the investigation. I would expect that in the coming months and weeks, we will see reports from his friends, people talking to them and all that. I'm going to try and get in contact with them as soon as I can, but... For now, we don't know much. Personally, I would very much like to know what this good deed that was uh, referenced by his stepfather, Chris Whited, was. Because all evidence pointed to Riley last being seen by the river, the search generally focused around there. And on the 16th, they put divers and boats into the water to check the bottom of the river, while canines as well as drones were up over land. One interesting thing that I noticed was highlighted in most of the news stories is that Riley's family did not believe he was in the river at this point. But with nothing to say that Riley was anywhere else, that was the only place that the police could think to search. It would not be until the next day that there there was finally any sort of break in the case because two TikTokers who were going and looking around trying to find evidence of Riley's whereabouts came across his debit card laying in the banks of the river and it was as they said covered by some leaves. Now to be clear the TikTokers had the permission of the family they had already gone and spoken to him about it this was not exploitative they were genuinely trying to help and they came across the debit card bearing the name Riley Strain as well as another card it said it was a common access card that was labeled with uh, the name Caden. None of the articles I was able to find gave the precise location of where this debit card was found, but based on the other information that we have, it's possible to deduce a general area it could have been. The articles say that it was found on an embankment between Gay Street and the Cumberland River, so we know that it has to be before Gay Street becomes uh, First Avenue North. We also know that we saw Riley very much not on the bank of the river, talking to a police officer just a couple hundred yards to the south. So if you'll look to the map that's currently on your screen, that's why I've suggested the debit card is in the marked location. And if you look at that location, it's not exactly easy to get to. This is a steep embankment. There is no ramp. There's no staircase. You'd essentially have to clamber down it on your hands and feet. And in order to do this, you would have to deliberately leave the sidewalk and then for some reason decide to climb down a slope. So while the find didn't really tell us how he would have gotten down there or why he would have tried to go down there, what it did tell police was that they really should be focused on the river. It also gained them the assistance of the United Cajun Navy, which is an organization that typically assists with disaster relief, but also does get involved in some search and rescue. Of course, as with most of the things in this video, a few things about this strike me as odd, and I'll get to them in a moment, but the thing I want to emphasize right now is that they did not find his wallet. They only found his debit card. The next updates to come were on the 18th, and we got two of them. This is the day that the body cam footage showing Riley walking up Gay Street was released, and it's also the day that a family friend by the name of Chris Dingman told the media about Riley's last text message. A girl that is described as somebody Riley has been seeing, or a friend, but not a girlfriend, texted him to ask how the night was going, how the trip was going, how he was doing, and he replied, good lops. Text message, this good lops, actually got a fair amount of people buzzing on the internet because nobody really knew what it meant. There were a lot of people saying maybe it was some sort of obscure slang where he was saying, uh, good, low on power, sorry, which of course would make it odd that his phone never gave a low power notification through Life360. Personally, I think that they may be overcomplicating it a bit. If you pull up your phone and you go into your, your, your keyboard, you'll probably see that L and P are right next to each other. 
you should see the L and P are right next to each other if you have a standard English keyboard. I personally have never seen somebody use the abbreviation L-O-P-S to mean low on power sorry, and while I'm older than Riley, I'm really not that much older than Riley. I'm 26, my girlfriend is Riley's age, I asked her, she also has not heard of anybody using L-O-P-S to mean low on power sorry. I think the most likely situation here is that a drunk 22 year old tried to reply good lols and hit the P instead of the L. This is also the day that the information that his phone did not die but rather was turned off came out. The news on this subject was quiet for a couple of days until the 21st when Fox 17 released an article in which they actually spoke to a homeless man who requested not to be identified but gave them some information that in my opinion is very interesting no matter how true it is. Now this homeless man said that he lived on the bank down by the river with his wife. He said that they had heard a commotion and that when they looked up towards the source, that means that they were down by the river and Riley was up there, that they saw Riley and they described it as follows. He almost fell over. The last bush right there caught him. He was very, very intoxicated I've never seen anyone stumble like that before. Now this right here, if there was nothing else, would make me immediately assume that Riley fell down, rolled into the river, drowned, and washed away. But that is not what he says happened. And what frustrates me a little bit as well is that he, he told detectives this. He told the investigators about what happened and it just seems totally glossed over. They didn't, you know, it, in my opinion, this right here, if it's a true statement, is something that would immediately suggest foul play. Because that homeless man said the reason he did not go up to check on Riley himself is because when he called up to ask if the person was okay, another voice came through and said, he's just drunk, he's okay. Once again, this is a situation where we're not given an exact location of the encounter, but I think based on the evidence, I was able to say that it's definitely before the James Robertson Parkway and it's definitely after he was seen by the police officer because he was alone when he passed the police officer. Now, it could be possible that this occurred before he passed the police officer between him being sighted on that traffic camera and the body cam appearance. But if that were the case, that means that this person was physically with Riley, saw him, spoke to him, spoke to somebody else about him, and then did not come forward to tell anybody about it. This person also did not accompany him towards the police officer, did not call him a ride, anything of the sort. So that would suggest to us that somebody came across a guy so drunk that he almost fell down a hill and died and reported it to absolutely nobody. Again, possible, but if that's what happens, I have questions about how this is not a suspicion of foul play incident. I just think that if a person who was not involved in Riley's disappearance saw him and even like watched him stumble and fall down a hill, they probably would have come forward to talk about it. So that's why my reasoning is this probably occurred after he passed the police officer, if it occurred at all, and we'll get into that later. On the 21st, there was also an interview with a Chris Salisbury, who is a Nashville-based uh, homelessness activist, and he spoke to News Nation. And what he told them was that the homeless community had told him about another guy who they called Ross, and he was a member of the community, who had been seen wearing a shirt that matched the description of Riley's black and white shirt. And according to Chris Salisbury, this homeless man named Ross told everybody that he had found the shirt hanging over a railing by Fort Nashboro. Now, the problem with this, of course, is that Riley had never been down to Fort Nashboro that night. That was not along his route at all. So, of course, this made a lot of people suspicious of Ross. Did Ross know something? Was Ross really the last person to see Riley? Did he lie about where he found the shirt? Because he can't have found the shirt if it's Riley's where he said he did. But again, this is one of those things I was talking about where there were a number of things that popped out at me, so I'll get to this in a moment. And part of the reason I want to get to it in a moment is because I've been waiting to get to this, which is that on the 21st, reporting came out that revealed a very important detail, in my opinion which is that there is other unreleased footage of Riley that night. Riley's parents, at least his mother and his stepfather, told News Nation that the video shows Riley walking toward the bridge, last seeing him at a sign marked as 14-3 for the bridge's height. And according to them, this video basically shows him like jogging for a little bit, walking for a little bit, passing the sign, and then he's out of frame, he's out of view. 
and I, I watched the interview. I don't want to impugn anybody's uh, honesty. I just, as I watched the interview, there were direct, pointed questions asked by the anchor that sort of went, were, were dodged or unanswered by Riley's parents. And I don't think that they're being dishonest because they want to mislead the media. I think that if they were leaving anything out, it was at the instruction of the police. And I say that because the police office's reasoning for not releasing the video doesn't make sense to me. They simply say that the video is low quality and all it shows is that Riley was walking towards the bridge, so why release it? It doesn't help with anything. But that description applies to all the other videos released of Riley. They're all low quality and all they show is Riley walking. And it was upon reading that detail that it was really cemented for me that something's not right here. Something is off about this case. And again, about to get into that. We're very close to the analysis section, don't worry. But first we need to talk about what happened after the 21st, because on the 22nd, the body of Riley Strain was pulled from the Cumberland River about eight miles downstream near the, the nation's neighborhood of Nashville. And specifically, it's said that it was found in the vicinity of 61st Avenue. Now, 61st Avenue itself does not run all the way to the river, but it does get pretty damn close to a road leading into a Lafarge, North America concrete mixing plant. That plant is relevant because while this is not explicitly stated, it is my opinion that it was workers at that plant who found Riley Strain's body. All that said is that workers were pulling an object out of the water when they discovered the body, and that would be basically the only place I can see that that would be happening. The Lafarge plant seems to have some sort of structure that actually goes into the water. It may be a couple of barges, but there appears to be some sort of superstructure that allows you to get down to the riverbank. And when he was found, it immediately brought more questions to light because Riley Strain was found wearing the shirt he was last seen in. What he wasn't wearing were his blue jeans or his cowboy boots, and his wallet was not on him. According to his stepdad, all that was found on him was his watch and his shirt. As you can imagine, this immediately created questions about the whole Ross situation, and we're gonna get into that too, but I wanna talk about the autopsy results for a minute, because as I said, this was the part that initially led me to look into the case this early, this soon, because preliminary autopsy results declared it an alcohol-related accidental drowning, even though Riley had no water in his lungs. Now, dry drownings are a thing. They do occur, just with significantly less frequency than your standard wet drowning. Typically, a dry drowning occurs for one of two reasons. Either somebody is intoxicated, so their muscles aren't in proper order, and their throat closes up as they're trying not to breathe in water. However, the other way that a dry drowning can occur, and I believe dry drownings account for about 20% of all drownings, is if the person who drowns was resisting being drowned. Essentially, if somebody is holding your head underwater and you're trying not to inhale the water, that could also lead to a dry drowning. So what that means is that a dry drowning does not necessarily mean that you were drowned, but it also doesn't necessarily mean that the drowning was accidental. And between that and a few of the other things I noted that I said, I'll get to this soon, this just doesn't sit right with me. As I said, the first thing that struck me was the autopsy and the reasoning. Police Chief John Drake told the media that they actually kind of expected this to be the case, that drowning victims typically do surface after 14 to 20 days. The problem with that is that's not true. Now, if you were to Google how long does a body take to resurface after being submerged, you probably will see a result saying 14 to 20 days. A body will typically surface in warm water in just two to three days, and then this increases incrementally as the water gets colder. In the cases we looked at from La Crosse, Wisconsin, considerably further north and in the Mississippi, where the water was colder at the time of these drownings, the bodies took five or six days to surface. This means that this body should have surfaced within three and six days, not 14 to 20. The autopsy also bugged me a little bit, and what it says is that this was an accidental alcohol-related drowning pending a tox screen, and that he had no injuries, no traumatic injuries that would suggest foul play. Yet Riley was found with no pants and no shoes and no wallet. Typically, when a body is found with no pants, shoes, or wallet, there are a few different foul play possibilities to consider. With these autopsy results, if you say that this was not foul play, 
The implication is that Riley left a sidewalk, stumbled over an embankment, fell all the way down without getting caught on a single tree, branch, or bush, rolled into the water, traveled eight miles downstream, and in that process, lost his cowboy boots, pants, and wallet. Now to this, the police said that it's not unusual for clothes to come off in water, but I simply disagree with their analysis there. In every single one of these cases we've looked at, where somebody drowned in the river, they were found fully clothed. And when we look at the actual clothes he was wearing, two things that do not come off easily are cowboy boots, and waterlogged jeans. Because Riley was a tourist, he was wearing his jeans tucked into his cowboy boots, so we decided that this would be the best way to test how hard this would be. And I'm not helping Aiden to get my foot out of this shoe at all. Aiden is just pulling, I'm neither hindering him nor helping him. And these are boots that I bought in Nashville. There's no guarantee that these are exactly the kind of boots that Riley would have been wearing. He might have gotten cheaper ones, these were a little on the pricey side, but I'm not saying that it is impossible for two cowboy boots and a pair of jeans to slip off of somebody in the water. All I'm saying is that we've never seen boots and pants come off of a body in a single drowning case that we've looked at, and we just gave you a demonstration of how hard it is to pull cowboy boots off of a leg. Of course, it is still possible that he actually did lose his pants and boots in the river, but it brought us to another weird aspect of this story, his debit card. And as I mentioned earlier, Riley's debit card was found, but not Riley's wallet. And it doesn't make sense that he would have his debit card out in his hand at a time like this. As for the possibility that he didn't have his debit card out and in his hand, it doesn't make any sense that he would somehow manage to drop his debit card, but not his wallet. But if I put on, you know, my, I've been watching lots of Criminal Minds lately cap, it does make some sense that somebody trying to throw investigators off might plant his debit card there, just so that people would start looking in the wrong place. And if we look at when the debit card was found, it gets a little bit more suspicious, because the 16th is the first time that a true search of the river is conducted. And then the very next day on the 17th, a piece of evidence reinforcing that they should be searching the river is found. If I'm a killer, I'm gonna take the opportunity to misdirect the police, and I'm gonna leave the debit card alone without the wallet, because it's a lot easier to see a debit card than a wallet. But that's not the only problem with the debit card. It's not just why is it not in the wallet, it's also that it's in a location that shouldn't be possible. We know Riley made it to the sign, the 14-3, that tells the height of the James Robertson Parkway Bridge. We also know that his phone, that Life360 I should say, says that his phone turned off as he went under the bridge. Now, considering that the location given by Life360 could be off by 50 yards in either direction, I'll, I'll give it that it could be that he never made it to the bridge, except that there is a fence immediately after that sign. Like, you pass the 14-3 sign, and maybe 10 feet later, on the right side, a fence starts, which is, it's a chain link fence. You'd have to climb over it, or deliberately go around it before it starts in order to fall over there. And just 30 yards south of that, but on camera the entire time, is a wooden guardrail. So there is a 90 foot gap here where you could feasibly accidentally go over the ledge. And according to Riley's parents, he is visible for 80 of those feet. And then the only place where he's not is the 10 feet between that sign and the fence. This means it's extremely unlikely that Riley could have walked over to the embankment and then gone down without being seen by the cameras or deciding to climb over a fence. In addition to that, the fence then continues as far as I could tell from Google Street View. Like, it, I do not see where the fence ends on Google Street View. But what I did see on Google Street View was an interesting sign which says that the area behind the jail is monitored by a camera 24-7. And that got me thinking about the footage that the police refused to release. And the fact that they said they won't release it because it's low quality and all it shows is Riley walking. It also got me thinking about some things his parents said during their interview with News Nation because it, it sounded almost like they said they had video of him walking under and out from under the James Robertson Parkway Bridge. But then another thing they said is that the last video footage they have of him is at the sign. And yet we know that the Davidson County Jail is there and that there are cameras monitoring the area on the other side of the bridge. As I said before, I have no intention of impugning the integrity of Riley's family. 
Again, I think if they did not tell the truth or if they withheld something, that it was on the orders of the police. What I also don't believe is that that's the last footage they have of Riley. I don't know particularly why they're not releasing the footage, but what I can say is that if they were to release it, it would prove one of two parties is lying about something. Either the footage will show that Riley was alone that night, in which case it seems like the homeless guy is probably lying about seeing Riley stumble and about the second person with him. But if the footage shows that Riley is not alone, it means that the police are lying. Both of these scenarios have important, relevant implications, as there would have to be a reason for these lies. And those are reasons that only the lying party could divulge. But then there's the area where the body was actually found, and while it's not generally accessible to public traffic, it's very much accessible if you have a pass to get into the Lafarge North America plant. Now the reason I said that it would be possible for a Lafarge employee is because there's a gate, and I assume that that gate is closed at night and that in order to get through it, you have to be there on company business. Of course, it's also possible that access isn't monitored and that the gate is not closed at night and you can drive in and out during off hours. I don't know, I would have to ask Lafarge, I guess. And as I mentioned earlier, that Lafarge plant does have a structure in the river where someone could reasonably drive up to that structure, get out with a bag perhaps of some sort, or a, a wheelbarrow, roll something down to that structure, bring it down to the river, and plop it right in, and make it look like that body floated from Nashville. Of course, what I've just said in no way proves that's what happened. I just want to make sure everyone's aware of the possibility. And all of that is on top of the fact that we have absolutely no idea why Riley decided to walk in the direction he initially walked. And the reason this is so weird to me is that it's really hard to get lost on Broadway, even when you're completely hammered. I have been there, I have done that on my 25th birthday. And yet, despite the fact that Riley, even drunk, should have known that he had to walk at least a couple of blocks on Broadway, got off immediately at the nearest place he could turn off the street. He then proceeded to take a route that if he was at all present in his own mind, if he was short of being blackout drunk, he should have at a certain point realized he was not where he was supposed to be. And yet at no point did he check his phone. Even when his friends called him to ask where he was, he didn't check to see if he was actually headed for the hotel. And this part brings us to the phone, which of course either was turned off or destroyed the moment he's last seen on camera, at least as far as the police have said. We know his phone stopped updating Life360 at 9.53 p.m. The app says it was turned off or lost network. We know this happened at the James Robertson Parkway Bridge, and we know that that area is monitored 24-7 by security cameras. But for now, that's everything we have. That's all we know, at least until the talk screen comes back and some more information is released about his decomposition levels. But I have a very bad feeling about this case based on its similarities to other ones we've looked at. As I've said on a few occasions, I'm not convinced on the idea that all of the quote-unquote smiley face killer theory stories are linked, but as we've gone and looked at a few different clusters, there were some that really, really do seem like they're more than the police are letting on. And those are primarily the ones in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and also to a slightly lesser extent, those in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. When it comes to consistencies with the cases in La Crosse specifically, we have that Basically all of them had dry drownings. All of them had a BAC. In most cases, it was between 0.2 and 0.33. We don't yet know particularly what Riley's blood alcohol content was, but based on how he was stumbling, it was likely on the higher side. Riley was actually a little taller than usual, but most of these guys are between average height, 5'8", 5'9", and slightly above average. We're talking 6 foot to 6 2. They're also typically in good shape. These guys rarely look like they are overweight, even though they sometimes may be on the thinner side. And in almost all cases, these are white victims. Now, when it comes to stuff we don't know yet, aside from what I think may be the police withholding some information from the public, there's a few things that could be important. For example, the toxicology report. We need to know, did he have GHB or Rohypnol, something like that? Was he given some other drug? Did it look like he had taken a drug on purpose? Could it be that there was something other than alcohol messing with his mental state? Another important unknown is the decomposition level. 
is this a body that looked like it was in the water for 14 days, or is this a body that looked like it was in the water for 14 hours? One thing that we frequently see with these accidental drownings as we cover them is that the level of decomposition, the extent to which a person's body has deteriorated, does not match the suggested time of death. Probably the most egregious example we looked at was Tommy Booth, who clearly had been dead less than 72 hours when he was recovered, and yet they said that he had been dead 14 days. However, we think that Tommy was likely organized crime and a local issue not connected to the rest of this. Another case that we don't think is necessarily related to these, but that might be important to note, is the case of Todd Geib, who was in the water allegedly 21 days and yet had decomposition suggesting he had been in less than 21 hours. So until we know what the state of Riley's body when it was recovered was, it's hard to say if this will be a factor. If he's found and he legitimately does have what appears to be 14 days or even a week's worth of decomposition on him, then I'm more willing to accept that this could have been something that happened the night of. We also don't have any real details about Riley's personality and what kind of person he was. Was he the type to get into a fight? Was he the type to avoid conflict? You know, is he the type of person who, if somebody pissed him off, wouldn't let it go? Is he the type of person who tended to inject himself into situations that might get him in trouble? And then there's another thing related to the autopsy and the decomposition, which is the fact that we don't know his specific injuries. All they said was he didn't have any traumatic injuries that would suggest foul play. But did he have injuries that suggested he fell down an embankment? If he did, we should, we should expect a large number of antemortem bruises and abrasions all over his body. He was wearing a short sleeve shirt, so he should have cuts up and down his arms from branches and rocks and whatnot, and he should have bruises basically on every limb. In fact, I would expect that he could even have something like a broken bone or a cracked skull from that kind of fall. We also don't know what his exact blood alcohol content was, as it appears the police have not released that, or what his tolerance was like. And while that's not exactly scientific, we do know that this guy was a 22-year-old senior in a fraternity at a large land-grant publicly funded state university. As somebody who also went to a large publicly funded land-grant state university, I can say that his lifestyle probably included some binge drinking. And I say that because I also had a lifestyle that included binge drinking and I was not even in a fraternity. Now, do Missouri students drink like Penn State students? Probably not. We're exceptionally talented at that aspect of college life. So, even at 165 pounds, Riley probably had a higher tolerance than you might expect. And I say that as a guy who, at 165 pounds, who attended a state university of this size, could outdrink all of my liberal arts school friends even when they were much larger than me. The reason knowing his tolerance could be important is that it could show us if his behavior was out of the ordinary. His friends probably knew how many drinks he had, and they could probably tell us if he was behaving oddly for how much he'd consumed, or if everything seemed normal. If he was behaving oddly for how much he consumed, that means that something probably happened at the bar that led him to make the decisions he made later in the night. If at the bar he was behaving normally for what should be expected at that point in the evening, then that tells us that whatever occurred likely occurred outside the bar. By the same logic, we can also look at his blood alcohol content, and if it's anything below a 0.2, we can pretty reasonably say his behavior doesn't make sense. It seems like something else was going on. And sort of similar and associated with this is his medical and psych history. We don't have that either. Was there something that he, a physical condition he may have had that could have led him to make weird decisions while drunk? Did he have a history of running off? Did he have a history of uh, certain types of ideation? I mean, nobody has suggested this could have been on purpose. Everybody thinks he didn't mean to go into the water. So it's likely that he wasn't experiencing depression or at least that if he was, he wasn't showing signs of suicidal ideation. But if that information were available, it could again tell us something about the victim profile here or the possibility that he's not at all a victim. But of course, in looking at this case, I wasn't only gonna look at the things that were consistent or unknown. I didn't wanna you know, make this a confirmation bias issue or me saying that there was a mystery where there isn't. I also took a look at what's inconsistent with the other cases we looked at that we came to the conclusion were likely more than they were led on to be. And there was. This case differs from the La Crosse, Wisconsin and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania cases in that Riley was about six inches too tall. As I said, however, there are other things that we don't know yet, and those things may prove that this was very truly an accident. It may come up that Riley has a whole bunch of 
uh, scrapes and abrasions that show that he likely fell down that hill. It could show up that he was not drugged and that he was really drunk, more drunk than we thought. But when, you, when I take everything into account on this, it looks more likely than not, at least to me, that we're dealing with foul play. And the thing that does it for me the most is, is that last video, what is alleged to be the last video of Riley passing that sign and then ending up in the water, because I just don't see how that happens. I don't see how the guy passes that sign and then within the 10 feet or so between that sign and the fence, goes over that embankment. And that's if we assume that the Life360 location that was given is inaccurate, that it's within a margin of error of some kind. So when I finished up the writing for this video, when I, when I compiled everything, my goal was not to say, hey, here's a, a case that the police swept under the rug or that they missed or something like that. It was to say that if the police do genuinely think this is a drowning, I want them to take a second look because th there's maybe one prior case in Nashville in the last few years. And I can't remember the guy's name off the top of my head, but similar kind of deal. Guy left the bar. It was in 20, I want to say 2021. Guy left a bar, got on a scooter, went towards that bridge, and then allegedly a security camera caught him getting into the water of his own volition, but I couldn't find the footage to review it myself. Could be connected, could not be. But my point in saying that is that Luke Homan, for example, in La Crosse, Wisconsin, is the most famous disappearance there. The, not disappearance, the most famous drowning death there in the smiley face killer thing. He's not by any means the first. He's nearly a decade in. My concern is that if the police are too quick to say this was just a freak accident, this is just a tragic mistake that this kid made, the bodies might start to pile up and they may not realize that bodies are piling up until it's too late. Based on the pattern that we've been seeing in some of these cities that we've looked at, my chief concern is that Riley could be the first of up to five or six people. And another conclusion that I came to while researching this case is that I don't think the police believe this was an accidental drowning. I think whatever they are not telling us, whatever they won't show us, that footage from where Riley really goes missing, where he drops off the face of the earth, I think the public needs to know what happened. And this is not to say that the, the police can't handle it. This is to say the police haven't handled it. I hope that this was just a horrible accident, that Riley Strain was just an extremely unlucky young man, and that this will be the end of it. But if it is not, then we need to know what the police aren't telling us, because I think this has been happening in other places in the country. I don't think this is the first time. I don't know that it's necessarily the same culprit, but I, I just see too many similarities to let it go. But right now, we don't have the information we need to make a determination in either direction. All I can do is implore the Metropolitan Nashville Police Department not to let this go. Even if you keep it behind closed doors, even if publicly you say that, that this is a simple accident, that nothing's happening, do not shut down, do not let it go cold, do not let yourselves believe that this is nothing. Because on the, even if, even if it's a less than 10% chance that it's not nothing, that is too great. That is too much danger, and I, I don't want to see anybody else die. As for our part, we're going to keep our eyes on this. We're going to keep watching to see how things develop. I'm going to reach out to the police department and, you know, offer anything that we can. Uh, I, I don't know if they'll take us up on that. Historically, police departments haven't, uh, Ridley being one particularly bad group, but we're going to keep our eyes on it. We're going to keep monitoring. And as more information is released, we will find ways to update you guys, whether it's a little addendum in other videos on this subject, or whether it's when we get to do the final analysis video of the smiley face killer theory. Either way, we will let you guys know as things progress. And, you know, once again, I just, I, I hope I'm wrong. I would rather that, you know, a few years on, I look stupid for making this video than a few years on be telling people I was right when we made this video. All of that said, if you would like to support what we do here at the Lore Lodge, you can subscribe to us on Patreon for just $1 a month. You get access to our new, uh, well, not new, but rebooted Drunk Folklore, Drunk History style podcast. That's going to be a live show where we sit down with, with, you know, our drinks and a camera. You will also get access to that if you are a 
YouTube channel member. That is $5 a month, and you can do it just by subscribing to this channel. We also have other channels. We have The Weird Bible, which just recently got a new episode live with Wendigoon going over the Easter story. We also have The History Hut, which we're working on bringing content to, The Lore Lounge, and my personal channel, Aiden Mattis, where we stream everything from music to video games. Then we have uh, our, our merch, which you can still buy through the little panel underneath this video. But we are moving over to Bunker Branding, so keep an eye out for that update soon. We also have a Discord where you can go and hang out with members of the community and play video games with us on the occasions we do that. I also hop into voice chats now and then, or I'll, you know, involve myself into the conversation. It's a little treat. You can get there by going to bit.ly slash join the lodge. If you want to know how we stay awake while researching for these shows, you can get our coffee. It is from Tableau Roasting Company. It is called Mount Pocono Perk, and I designed it myself. I was a barista, and I worked in an artisan roastery for years, so I, I, would, I would recommend that you trust me. And if you like our analysis, but you want to hear it in a more live format, or you want to come to a Q&A session, we have a podcast that is live every Sunday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. We recently built this fancy schmancy new studio for it, so we hope it was worth it. Well, with all of that said, I am Aiden Madison. Thank you for stopping by the Lore Lodge.